Thank you very much, Jürgen. Uh, so I start as all the talks start on November uh, 9th, 1989. I was a junior resident in neurology at the University of Munich, and I just started to treat my first patients with Parkinson's disease. Uh, Parkinson's disease, as far as we can tell, has been around for centuries, maybe for millennia. It certainly was around um, in uh, Berlin uh, in the first half of the 19th century. This is Wilhelm von Humboldt, and here's a statue not far from here. Uh, in front of the Humboldt University. And here you can see his signature. Between 1824 and 1834, progressively smaller signature. This is a symptom called micrographia, and it's an important symptom of the more general uh, phenomenon of akinesia or bradykinesia. So all movements are getting slower, are getting smaller over the years as the disease progresses. The reason for this symptom is the degeneration of a nerve cell population uh, in an area of the brain that is called the substantia nigra. Uh, and those nerve cells produce dopamine and deliver dopamine to the projection areas uh, of, the, um, uh, of, of those no neurons. Doesn't really work here with a laser pointer, uh, but that's a lower panel where you can see uh, the lack of, do lack of dopamine. Now, we can replace this dopamine with medication or correct the disturbed circuitries by drugs or deep brain stimulation. And here you can see the patient where you just saw the severe Parkinson's symptoms only minutes after his stimulator has been turned on, and he walks almost normal. So you might say, so what's the problem? Problem solved, we can treat the disease, patients can walk. Well, that's only part of the story. The disease progresses, and we have learned that over the years, many more non-treatable symptoms emerge, particularly cognitive decline, and a large proportion of the patients become more and more demented over time. Parkinson's disease is, by numbers of patients, the fastest growing neurodegenerative disease that we have on the world right now. So it is urgently needed that we find cures and treatments that uh, slow the progression of this disease, in addition to the symptom amelioration that we have here. Now, to do that, we, of course, would have to know what causes the cell death of those dopaminergic neurons. And here's where genetics comes in. When I started working on Parkinson's disease, it was generally considered not to be a genetic disease. But then, in the 1990s, a few rare families have been identified, like the pedigree here, where the disease seemed to be passed on from generation to generation in an autosomal dominant fashion. And at that time, the technology was there to identify disease-causing mutations in those rare families. And that's what we and many others did. And we identified mutations in two genes. One gene is called leucine-rich repeat kinase 2, LRRK2, or LRK2, as we call it, um, in one family, and we contributed to the identification of uh, another gene called GBA1, glucoserbrosidase, uh, that also uh, leads with a high probability to a typical Parkinson's disease. Now, both of those genes encode enzymes, and we have heard this morning what wonderful little machines enzymes are, uh, our brain and our brain cells are full of enzymes, and the mutations change the uh, activity of those enzymes. Mutations in the LARC2 gene increase the activity. They make the enzyme hyperactive. Mutations in the GBA1 gene decrease the activity of the enzyme, make it hypoactive. And therefore, treatments have to be developed and are being developed that inhibit the LARC2 activity or that increase and activate the GBA1 activity. And drugs that do these things are under development, are entering clinical trials in those families uh, that have this inherited form of Parkinson's disease. Now, we know that, and I told you, that those are only rare families. Well, they're not quite that rare. About 10% on average of Parkinson's patients have one of those mutations. 
There are some populations where the proportion is larger, 20, 30 percent, some where it's less, but on average it's about 10 percent. So what about the other 90 percent? Well, over time, technologies have developed that allow it to look at the genetic underpinnings in those sporadic Parkinson's patients too, uh, by using something that is called uh, genotyping arrays, where we can screen the entire genome from chromosome 1 to chromosome 22 uh, on hundreds of thousands, millions of individual locations in huge populations of patients. This is the result of a study, 37,400 cases, 1.4 million controls, and the frequency of those variants is compared, and it turns out there are many more locations in the genome that contribute to Parkinson's disease, but the ones that we have found in those rare families, GBA1 and LARC2, are among them. So here we see that the mechanisms, the molecular mechanisms that lead to Parkinson's in those rare families and to sporadic Parkinson's, as we call that, so those without identifiable clear genetic mutations, are the same. They are the same pathways that are operative. Now, there's another problem that is also an opportunity. We know now that by the time that symptoms develop, here at the line, PD diagnosis, more than half of the dopamine neurons are already gone. They're dead. They cannot be replaced. And I very much doubt that this will be possible in the foreseeable future. But what we also see is that there is a long prodromal period, probably 10, 15, 20 years, where this degeneration has already started, uh, but symptoms are minimal or even not at all uh, um, present to the patient. Uh, those prodromal phases, therefore, provide a window of opportunity. And if we manage to use the genetic uh, um, evidence to treat and to uh, slow down the progression of the disease process in this prodromal phase, we may be able to delay the onset of the disease beyond our natural lifespan. So one part of the job is now to identify and detect uh, those prodromal processes that develop while the patient doesn't even know that he's about to develop Parkinson's disease. And I can tell you that this morning I had the breakfast with uh, Ferenc Kraus uh, and we decided to do a collaboration. He has the technologies and he will, show you, he will talk to you about that right now. We have the patient populations and the materials and what we'll do is uh, we will try to identify patterns of changes in the blood, in the cerebrospinal fluid, that indicate how far on this trajectory towards the disease a patient is. And if we're successful, maybe you're witnessing now the start of a new breakthrough. That could be, in the future, a world without Parkinson's. Thank you very much.